James 5, verses 14 through 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. So this is terrible advice. If you are sick, please consult a medical professional and don't freaking pray. Well, if you think that you have evidence that by praying to sweet Jesus or Zarathustra or one of those hammer throwing guys, you were healed of some terrible disease. Well, call in. We want to hear about it because the show's about to start. Hello, everyone. Today is September 17th, 2023. My name is Johnny P. And joining me today is MD Aware. MD, how you doing? Doing great. Happy to be back on the show. It's been, I don't know, long, long time, far too long since I've been on AXP. It's been a long time since you've rock and rolled. Well, I've never worked with you before. So that's today. Like I always say, I'm checking off all the good ones. And Fantastic. Uh, when I've gotten them all, off to the sunset. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to pray. I'm going to pray for, uh, for a Bermuda vacation, never come back. Hmm. Well, until such time, this is the Atheist Experience, a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of religion and government. Uh, before we get started on calls, we're going to go ahead and talk about our Share Your Experience that we sent out last week. The, last, the question last week was, we asked you, what should the Norse have had a god of but didn't? You know, it seems like we're going to trigger some non-secular pagans out there. And if they have something to say, welcome to call. We'll be very polite to them. But here are our top three answers. Number three, Goat Boy 33 says, the Norse needed a god to pray to for help with a hangover with all the mead and what have you. They probably, I suspect they did. I suspect one of the secondary class... Uh, classes of the gods is to aid you in um in hangovers md is there any any uh any tips and tricks that you can talk about for a hangover besides hydration oh uh, no it's all about hydration or prevention hey right ounce yeah, of prevention right. pound of cure see you learn something on this show you're not mm. just entertained all right number two rational pair says the norse god of mechanical breakdowns he really hates not doing preventative maintenance Yes, when when the giant flying goats that are pulling Odin's sky chariot need to be reshoed, who did they turn to? Who did they who did they turn to? Perhaps no one. Uh, number one, Coffee Warlock, and I like that name. The Norse should have had a god that was just tasked with keeping Loki from pulling uh, any shenanigans. It takes a village sometimes when you've got a mischief maker like that. Or a pantheon, perhaps. Yeah, a, 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 a veritable pantheon village of uh, super dudes. Well, that was our, that was our, our question of the week. Uh, we have another one for this week. We're not done with this yet. We've got more. And this week, I'm going to ask uh, MD the first question, and I'm going to ask him right now. What do you think Jesus's last words really were? Uh, I've been thinking about this. I think probably he was saying, I'll be right back. I'm just going to get some smokes. I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, he's got I that sort that. of like deadbeat yeah. dad vibe, you know, That's right. he's coming back one day, one day. He's, back. he's out there. He joined the merchant Marines <laughs> and uh, he's, he's out there uh, <laughs> shipping containers. Don't worry about it. Uh, Mary. Well, that's it. So if you've got something that you want to add to that, I've seen this time after time, people putting it in the comments. Don't you dare put this in, in, the, in the live chat. Put this in the comments so that we can read it. And sometimes I tune in and I look at them too so I can have 
one hell of a laugh when I read them. Uh, but yeah, please do it. And when next week, we'll read us your top three. All right. So I think it's about time. We've dillied and we've dallied enough. I know that we were talking about this this one beforehand. I want I want to talk to Lewis. Lewis is a guy coming out of Florida, and he says biblical scripture supports evolution. Parentheses, Genesis account. Uh, Lewis, you are on Atheist Experience with MD Aware and Johnny P. Angel, and we want to know what you mean by that. Go ahead, tell us more. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me on. I just, you know, see the scriptures, like especially the Old Testament um, account. If Moses really did go uh, 40 days and 40 nights in um, what we see in Exodus, he's, he's on the mount and he's up there, you know, smoking. And the I think uh, Luce might have like a bomb about to go off or something. There's like a countdown going on. Are you in danger? Do you need to call the Department of Homeland Security or perhaps your local bomb squad, Lewis? Um, I'm going to unmute you and let's see if maybe you've uh, you've made that call. Lewis, yeah, uh, you're unmuted. Hello? You're unmuted. Are you okay? First of all, are you okay? Uh, yeah. Yes, I am. All right, good. So, go uh, on. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, it was just my seat, though. I'm actually driving, guys, and um, thanks for having me on the air. Uh, Please yeah, uh, you know, keep your seatbelt on while you drive. I definitely see, yes. like, I, I see correlations, like, you know, in the scriptures yeah. with, uh, you know, with with evolution, you know? I, I just don't see what what's the commotion of all the arguing back and forth of both sides um if you know if the scriptures was a revealed which you know that's that's the position right uh the the scriptures is a revealed um message so we got to remember that genesis and all the first five books are revelations from god to moses so he's pretty much telling him what to write down and he's seeing pretty much the whole thing if, yeah. if he's on the mountains, right? And then we see a descriptive form. You know, it says right there all the way uh, from 1 to 24, um, it said that, you know, God created the heavens and the, and the heavens and the, and the earth and the earth was empty. And, and we can right. keep reading back and forth. And everything I hear back and forth from... When I when I come call in from even from Christians believers it doesn't matter which denomination they're always saying that God created and if you really read there it got and God said let the earth bring forth so the earth can bring forth its own its own things it says Lewis, it very clearly uh, Lewis so God created plants yeah. before he created light or created uh day and night i should say right well look what it's saying there you know it's not what i say right it, it's what I'm, I'm i'm reading a descriptive form let me just get there guys okay that's what that's where everything goes back and forth it says uh and then let's say, let's why, start from why don't you give us a, we're, we're kind of, I tell you what, I think and, and that God, maybe you're a little, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. All right. And it's no offense to you. You're a little distracted. Okay. You're driving. And I've, boy, have I had conversations in the car where I'm, where I'm talking and I'm rambling and I'm going to put you back on hold. When you get to your destination, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and we'll we'll bring you back, okay? So go. The call screen is going to go ahead and take care of that. So I'm going to um, return you to the queue, and we're going to take a call from um, Beast. Beast is a a fella uh, coming from Colorado who says he's been harmed by the church and he's losing faith. Beast, you are on AXP with uh, MD Aware and Johnny P. Tell us, uh, if you're comfortable doing so, about how you were harmed by the church 
and uh, the nature of your loss in faith. Uh, yeah, sure. No, I was, uh, I continue to talk about being sexually abused as a kid growing up and on an auxiliary gym at a church one time, uh, this was continuously happening and I already reached out to police who would not report because this guy was a good character in my community. Mm -hmm. Um, I was literally taken up being physically in front of other pastors who said I deserved it because I was claiming sexual abuse was happening with me. Now, other kids have been hurt by the same person in different communities and church People have called me a liar and a loon. Even a big, huge um, foreign ministries that is involved with foreign ministry there are those specific people that call me a liar and a loon. Though other kids came forward with abuse, and I don't know, I've I gone to these pastors and asked them to do mandate reporting, and they just determined that I'm a liar and cannot be believed for it. So that's why they didn't do any reporting. And the police, they often participate in the same church and. I don't know. I, I wasn't allowed to speak to uh, secular counselors growing up, and I was often forced to return to my sexual abuser. And it was all under the name of God and stuff. And he's always doing the demonstrations. He's getting the people to do the, you know, sing and dance and stuff. He even had a whole congregation sing and just rise up in the note of C. And he was more than proud to have people drinking beer in his private home and interpreting the Bible while grooming kids. And I told the pastor of this, and they knew and recognized that there, his church people were doing these things. But And he said he believed I was abused. But then I guess he did forgiveness. And when other victims came forward, and I said, hey, look, he heard kids after you confronted him about the abuse that has supposedly been, you know, told to you. And so they're always withholding. And the whole time they're withholding, they are speaking in prophecy and uplifting people for missions. And I'm like, well, your own Bible says, you know, you should correct your wrong before you go proceed. But hmm. they just make me an outcast and a liar. And I'm like, how are you getting prophetic messages of telling people they should do all these things, which is repeat so many times of your mission well, trip? But I can't get respect as a, you know, as a victim of abuse. And I, I fully, I used to go to Royal Rangers preaching the Bible. I've read it forward and backward okay. and other religions do. So, well, based on what, what's MD aware, what's your what's your initial thoughts on this? Well, I mean, this is sort of a tale as old as time in a lot of respects. Uh, people abusing a position of power and a position of trust, unfortunately. Um, I find it beast. You talk about the your lack of belief that these people are receiving prophetic messages and things like that. I agree with you. I don't think they are receiving prophetic messages. And, uh, and I think there is something unique about the attitude. Uh, I, you haven't told us, but I'm guessing you come from a Christian denomination and, uh, yes, it's and a Pentecostal type. Right. And so there's an interesting, uh, thing that I've noticed where an interesting phenomenon wherein because Jesus or whoever God can forgive your sins, uh, there is a belief that there is no further correction needed. You know, you do a bad thing and then you confess and you're forgiven by Jesus, by God, by the priest, whatever it is. And so you don't actually have to do any work to correct what you did wrong to the actual victims. Uh, and I think this is something that's been noted in some other analyses, uh, more so in the Catholic uh, Church with what happened in Boston. Um, but uh, this is like a common theme. Uh, whenever I hear about uh, abusive cases uh, in the church and Christian religion, it's the same theme where there's no uh, repentance uh, or there's no reparations made to the actual victim of the crime. It's all very self-centered. Uh, you know, I confessed, I sought forgiveness from Jesus, and I know that I was forgiven because Jesus said that he forgives everyone who truly believes, etc. Um, and so I feel very sympathetic uh, towards your position, obviously, uh, but not entirely surprised that, you know, you didn't receive any direct uh, results as far as you could tell. What do you think yeah. about that? Uh, I think it's painful and, you know, everything you guys say is actually solid and based in relativity. And every Christian that calls you 
did you just see my attitude? I've always grown up with, and I don't understand it. Like, I thought, you know, hey, your reaction on your atheist show is almost like a reflection of maybe your parents being Christian and your view, but then I listen to your people who you try to allow the opportunity to learn and discover from, and they just refuse everything you say, and I need you. So I'm like, mm. Back and forth of what is right and what is wrong, and I thought Jesus and his intentions was to be good to others no matter what, even gay. Like, you feed gay people. You don't say, hey, you're wrong, just bad, need punishment until you get it right, you need to suffer. No, you uplift them, and you make sure they're fed and clothed and have a good life. If they do something separate that you don't agree with, that's fine. It's not your right to take away their free will, but in the environment I grew up with, it's hostility and lies and confusion and a verdict against even people that they— they, they kind of spread hate groups, and I've always felt hated by the church for just being honest with them. Hmm. So it's it's weird. Beast, um, one thing, we, this is the atheist experience, but in large part it is uh, centered on a, a humanist-style uh, based moral system where we look at, imperfectly, though we might do it, a, a human focused or a living being focused for our vegan friends um, basis of morality. What is good for people? What is good for society, both the individual and the collective uh, insofar as they can be reconciled. And I believe that when you look at these sort of dictate style, moral systems coming out of, out of dogmatic, you know, but religious belief, it isn't focused on, it isn't focused on the well-being of the individual. It's focused on the overarching mission over the the the, the metaphysics, the uh, the plan of God as interpreted or at least as as proselytized by the humans in charge of the little society that uh, that belongs there. And I think you'll you'll find that what's good for the church community, they believe, is that. Uh, people who report abuses that would undermine the authority, those voices are downplayed, diminished, um, uh, made to be uh, not, not trusted because they have too much at stake. Because if that's wrong, then what if the interpretations that those people are doing are wrong? And if the interpretations are wrong, well, then where's their next check going to come from? It's uh, people aren't going to give money to people who are definitely wrong. So that's, that's unfortunate. Also, I think that uh, dogmatic religious institutions do not encourage skeptical thought or they do when it's convenient, when it's safe, when it's non-threatening of the social order. They or only that. within the confines of a, with, you know, within the dogma, right? Yeah. You're, uh, you're free to debate about and, and question the, um, the leaders uh, interpretation of a verse within you know a bible study group or something like that as long as you don't question the underlying uh, tenets of it right the underlying axioms that's why you see all these people on uh like if you ever watch a christian uh show they don't spend time talking about whether or not god exists right or whether or not the bible is true they talk about you know how they interpret and they do so much debate and they bring on one person who seems very skeptical of the uh, the hard line or whatever it is, uh, and they talk about some other interpretation, right? And it all gives the illusion of there being a great deal of uh, openness to new ideas and skepticism and debate and thought, but it's uh, it's on a very superficial level and it's very confined, right? There isn't a lot of like true free thought where you can ask any question or propose any uh, alternative, uh, only certain opinions are allowed. Right. Um, Beast, did you, when you, when you experienced this abuse, did you turn to governmental authorities? Did you call the cops? Did you do anything like that? Oh, I don't know how old you were. Oh, so yeah, maybe you talked yeah. to a teacher mm -hmm. or who did you talk to? No, uh I, you know, my teachers, they told me if the police weren't going to do anything, there was nothing they could do. Uh, the police member said that they, this guy worked for a, a, a the church organization that is also a after school program that is only 1% Christian organized. Um, yeah. Well, since my Manana's is, is, is the Boys and Girls Club of America also. Mm -hmm. So um, I even told the people who checked in at the Boys and Girls Club of America um, things that I was being abused. And they're like, that person? No, I know him. 
that's not possible. Mm-hmm. So, yes, police were always involved. Um, they came to my house. The first time uh, I was being snuck out of my home at night because he discovered me going to church. Um, he followed me home after church one time, did some crazy sick stuff, and then I eventually started taking me out at night. I, I called the cops at midnight and said he was doing this, and because I was a sleepwalker, my parents determined that I was just having a nightmare. But it wasn't the only time I called the cops and continued to talk about it. And like yeah. I said, I, I was physically assaulted in a, in a church. I dialed 911, and they had the police chief come and said, hey, look, we know you called the one time. You'll never be able to make a report. And that was, you know... Not again until I was 18 did I talk, but yeah. Well, you know, and, and what you're describing is, again, a larger, I believe, larger societal issue where we have an implicit trust of people who exist in these uh, faith positions, right? These, these faith leadership positions. Oh, he's a man of God. Uh, therefore, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do something like that. I know him or I've been to, been to church with him. He's a godly man. Plus also that interweaving of the secular and the religious societies, quite, quite frankly, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be up to a person who has a relationship with an individual. There's a report. There ought to be some kind of an investigation. And, and that might not result in, in, uh, in a conviction or even, even an arrest or anything like that. But at the very least, it should go further than that. But, but our society tends to, uh, to, to make give give these allowances, well, they do so much good. Well, let's let's we on this show we stop and say, what is the good that's being done? Sometimes, it's you know charitable work. Sometimes it's the charitable work is only church stuff, right? And we would think that that's not really helpful to society. Um, but I would also like to point out and just bring this back to our the initial verse that I was reading, right? The the Bible and you know Jesus and you know all the, most religions don't actually care about your corporeal physical well-being. Um, they care about your so-called spiritual well-being and your the destiny of your soul. That's why you can have God doing all of these things telling people to do all these terrible things and people doing terrible things to human beings in the name of God. And those people are righteous in the eyes of God because there's a bigger game at play. Well, we don't believe in, in anything past this game that we're playing. And so um, that's why I, I think it's especially atrocious that these people have such pull in society and have the ability to influence domestic and foreign policies because their, their, their big book doesn't give a hoot about the well-being of living people. They cares about the, the so-called souls of these people. And so I wouldn't trust someone who's in a death cult to run my uh, society. And I don't know why we choose to do that, but I guess they don't see it that way. Um, any, any, any thoughts on that one, Beast? Well, it's like they always make you guys the bad people, but I've always seen goodness. And you're like, you're saying society deserves more. And like, it's just, it's conflicting because I learned that you're supposed to be good to others through the word. I believe that Exodus was the point of the Jewish priest making slave laws that was mimicking the world's view. And that there was a message to say, you need to exit and get out of slave law that you are trying to imitate according to things. That's what I believe. But when I look to the people who are teaching it, it's not true. And but I still believe, and I thought that was the integrable thing to do for all people, no matter what they choose to free will. I don't want to take somebody else's free will, free will away, and I don't want to change forcibly their opinions by condemning them. Because God, in my opinion, didn't never, never instructed people by saying, "Hey, you're wrong. You that's bad. You do not do that." Because then your kids who don't have the same belief as somebody else will tell them that that they're wrong when that's not true, because of the reflection that they give, and it's just. Uh, you know, God, in my understanding, never disciplined to condemn, meaning Christians who are condemning all the time to correct people it just seems wrong. So that's my view of what I thought was good and integral in society. But my people who feed me these things and can't seem to agree with anything like you said and well, go about well, Beast, instead. So, Beast, I, 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 you're going through a lot, and I don't mm-hmm. really want to have a terrible argument with you on this, but... Um, 
maybe MD Aware knows this one. I don't have it off the tip of my head, but there were some boys making fun of a bald prophet in the Old Testament, and God sends a she bear to murder the children. So that's a that sounds like condemnation to me. Yeah, Old Testament is pretty mm. uh, severe on people who insult or otherwise uh, injure yeah. uh, God slash the people he likes. Yeah, and the New Testament's not really much better because mm. potentially, if you don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart as his as your personal Savior, because you don't have enough evidence to believe such a claim you could potentially be burning in hell or obliterated out of existence for eternity as a result of that. That doesn't seem fair. And, and there's no remedy at that point. You know, mm -hmm. can you get out of hell? It doesn't say you can. Can you come back from oblivion? Well, it doesn't seem like you can. Uh, it's not once really the oblivion if you can hell? come back from it. Yeah. Well, I it's, it's in the book. In, in Jerusalem that was like leopards hung out at hell. I thought there was an afterlife, but hell is comparable it was a trash pit where leopards or people lived. But you're all right. Hellfire is a preach thing that even their own Christian people teach without understanding. So I will mm -hmm. tell you, I will tell yeah. you this. The whole concept of a hell is uh, arguably not. Um, there's no redeeming a person once they're in hell or there's no redeeming a person once they're obliterated from existence, once their souls are destroyed because they fail to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. That's why it's just kind of terrible nonsense to me. But um, Beast, um, have you talked to Recovering from Religion or the Secular Therapy Project? No. Are you familiar with those? I am not familiar with them. I'm going to say it again for those in the audience, for those in the back row. Recovering from Religion and the Secular Therapy Project. Check those out. Go online, check them out. There's folks there who can help you through the trauma that you're going through. Um and to help you get to a spot where you can, I'll say reconcile, but at the very least move on and make the most of the time you have left, which is, as far as we can tell, all anyone ever has mm -hmm. uh, is the rest of your lives. And so life's not over. Uh, it's just beginning. And it sounds like you are in the process of deconverting, at least from a very toxic church. Perhaps you will be leaving uh, the faith in its entirety. Um, and make, make this understanding known to yourself that once or if you were to leave a, a sort of a, a faith position, the journey is not over. It's just begun in that sense to make meaning, to establish rights and wrongs, and to work in a, work to make society a better place. So, um, But I'm going to let you go, Beast, and I do appreciate you calling. Um, I think that although I don't know if we were particularly helpful mm. to fix that church you were in, it should shine a light on the kind of world, the kind of world without consequences for those kind of people that the religious extremists, the white Christian nationalists want to bring and, and arguably other forms of religions as well want to do that to us where they can do no wrong. Um, uh, I have a question for you, John. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're, you're involved in the law profession, correct? That's what they tell me. Do you... Is is the notion of character witnesses still a thing? Yeah, yeah. And, and what are your thoughts on the validity? This is a very leading question, counselor. Uh -oh. But uh, so this is a cross examination. Um, <laughs> the validity of it? I mean, it, it makes sense that you'd be able to do so. Yeah, of course, the 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 person accused or the person um, whose whose character is being is in question would present. Uh, character evidence to to sort of bolster their own credibility and the mm. the the decider of fact whoever that may be keeps in mind that the person uh, uh trying to bolster that that individual's credibility is themselves subject to uh, certain relationships certain financial and emotional social familial friend relationships that would cause them to look at uh the person in, in a in a in a skewered light, rose tinted glasses. I had mm. that happen. I had a, I won't go into the details here, but I did have somebody who, who was testifying as to a particular individual saying how good this person was, how trustworthy what they were, how they did this, how they did that. And then you start asking them questions. You know, well, what if, what if I were to tell you this were to happen? Or what if, what if this fact were established? Would that make you change your mind? And 
no good answer is a good answer because then it's like, well, it would never change my mind. I'm immune to facts or, well, I didn't know about that. Oh, okay. Well, if you believe this other fact, then this other person, then this person might not uh, have so much faith in this individual. Yeah. Does that I mean, answer that your seems question? To be the, that seems to be the problem that, that uh, Beast was facing, right? Is these, yeah. the people who were his alleged abusers mm -hmm. uh, presumably had a great deal of, you know, informal character witness uh happening happening never made it obviously to any sort of trial situation yeah. yeah or any situation where you know the facts were even investigated people were prejudging based on uh their understanding of the person's character yeah. it's a very i've obviously i come from a scientific background and i find the whole notion very strange wow. um yeah and i live in that, i live in that world of the gray, murky, muddy, bloody world of uh, human interaction. Yes, fair enough. And, uh, and and I'll tell you, it's it's incredibly frustrating sometimes how you don't have num you don't have just simple numbers and formulas and stuff. It's uh, and you can't do experiments either, right? Eh? <clears throat> it's con it's considered unethical. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Some would say it's unethical. Hey, you know we've got we've got um, we've got ways that you can support the ACA. I know that you're all itching to find out more, and so I'm going to tell you about it. You can, uh, you can, you can support the ACA by buying a custom engraved brick, and become part of the library's legacy. That's the Free Thought Library we're talking about. The Free Thought Library in beautiful Austin, Texas. Uh, they've got a video about it. Let's watch it now. Have you ever wanted to make a permanent impact on the atheist community of Austin? Help support our space for free thought by buying a custom engraved brick to be laid on the building grounds to help raise funds for improvements. Our building has stood as a beacon for years, bringing people together. But three years of emptiness due to the pandemic have taken a toll, leaving it in disrepair. Help us restore this hub of connection and support by buying a brick. Moses had his stone tablets, but we're doing our own version. Join our brick fundraiser and let your engraved messages stand the test of time minus commandments visit tiny.cc forward slash aca bricks for more information that's right buy a brick so we can get better windows amongst other things um double pane windows they're where it's at catch the fever um but you know you don't just have to buy a brick you can also become a channel member for as little as 99 cents a month click the join button below the video and that will give you special access to uh, certain emojis and what have you, and uh, disable slow mode, I believe. Also, you can send a super chat to us here live, and we will we will read it on air during the show if it's not uh, it's not too dirty. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. Shoot, now we're going to get some dirty ones. Um, all right, so we've got our um, our driver. Joseph from Georgia. Joseph, um, you're back on the air with MD Aware and Johnny P. Angel. And um, well, actually, you believe atheism live its imagination and atheists put too much trust into, into science. I had the wrong guy. <clears throat> Tell us more about your belief that atheism, atheism limits imagination. Okay, so as an agnostic, I believe that how humans perceive God is a very self-centered view, and that if there is a God, I don't think that He solely exists to serve us humans and grant us wishes. Because you're gonna have to slow down a little bit, Joseph, that, because you're talking very fast, and the signal isn't very okay. good. So, you said, repeat everything you said, please. Okay, so let me just slow down. Okay, so as an agnostic, I believe that how humans perceive God is a very self-centered view. If there is a God, I don't think that he so did to serve us humans and grant us wishes because because we've just been good people. That being said, I think it's important for us as debaters to view God in a different light from major religions that place the emphasis that place emphasis on the embodiment of God in human form. So to go on, if the universe has existed for let's say three hundred and sixty five days, as humans haven't existed for a tenth of a millisecond. You and many of the other atheists who are listening right now have a very strong conviction that there is not a God. I understand it. We're the only creatures on this strange world with these strange abilities. I believe it, it makes, 
I believe it's I believe it makes I believe it makes it that much more interesting that we are the only ones. With with that being said, I believe that this tiny blue planet is the most interesting place in the entire in the, in the entire universe, right? I believe atheists place too much trust in the science as a whole, and archaeologists only job is to assume. I'm sure you've are you're already aware of the missing links in the human evolutionary chain. Right, I'm gonna stop you. I'm gonna stop you right now. I'm gonna stop you right now. I'm muting you. Um you're reading something. I know you are. And that's fine. However, this is a show where we go back and forth. And you've said a lot of stuff that we haven't had a chance to address. And so you'll please forgive me for having sort of re forget everything that you said, trying to keep up because I'm thinking about it. And we're having a conversation. I'm thinking about it. And I want to give you the respect to address every point that you've made and my thoughts on it and MD Aware's thoughts as well, and the audience. They got to give them a chance to think. So going back to the very start, um, and I know I'm going to miss a lot, but that's kind of your fault. Um, you believe atheism limits imagination, and we put too much trust in science. Okay. I'm not a scientist. MD Aware is, is a medical doctor. We have Forrest Valkai who does science. We have people with neurology and a uh, you know, brain biology understandings and stuff like that. In my experience, even me as a, just a schmuck who yells at people for a living, um, I don't think that my imagination is limited at all because every time I find out something new about the world, uh, some new scientific discovery, something about uh, human interactions, um, my mind goes wild thinking of the possibilities. And have you ever seen Forrest Valkai go off on one of his tirades about some allele things and, and, and nerves and joints and MD aware, my God, that guy knows quite a bit about the human body and how it functions and, and taking care of it. Have you ever talked to student Dr. Ben? Have you ever he heard him talk about the various things about the human body. I think that science, a healthy understanding of science, sparks the imagination. Faith stops the investigation, in my experience. What are your thoughts on that, Joseph, from Georgia? Well, with what you just said, I... Wouldn't you say that, wouldn't you agree with the statement that for, our, for all of human history and whatnot, you know, it was the Christians who invested into science. It was the Christians who invested nope. into, nope. into art and whatnot. I'm not saying that your imagination is no greater or less than my imagination. I'm just saying that with the Christians and the Christian artists that, that I've met, like my mother, she is a fantastic artist. She is a Seventh-day Adventist. And yeah. the conviction that she has with 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 her paintbrush is like I can feel it. But when I look at atheist artworks online, you know they promote this, you know, just dark energy. Absolutely nonsense. No, Joseph. I'm a, folks in the audience. I paint and I draw and I do sculpture. Okay, there, it's out. I am a I am a I'm a yuppie lawyer artist who fancies himself a creative individual. My artwork has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the eternal void of the universe and the utter meaningless. No, forget that. It's about personal experience and expression and interrelations between individuals. Okay. I've done still lifes of people, friends who I want to give them a gift that they appreciate. I've done like, paintings of, of trees and landscapes because of the beauty of the world that I live in. And I want to somehow in some crummy way, make part of me reflect that beauty out there. I live in the world. Okay. And I know that eventually all of those mm -hmm. paintings, all of those drawings and my terrible, terrible uh, pottery will eventually be destroyed. Right. But it's a little bit of me within my time that I can put out there and maybe bring some joy or at least sarcastic jokes about how terrible I am or sincere ones 
it's a form of human expression. And your mother's connection to her Seventh Day Adventist art, that's a personal human expression as well. Okay? So that little comment, you can go flush that right down the, the toilet. Give me another example. Well, and if I may, um, you know, I have the MD. I also have a PhD in biomedical engineering. I had to do three years of science. Uh, science requires imagination. You know, I think that there's a, a misconception because a lot of people learn science. They do like high school science classes or even undergrad science classes. And they think, oh, science is just studying stuff in books. Uh, and you have to memorize these facts and these facts are immutable and uh, there's no room for imagination. Whatever you thought about that flower is now been explained away. All the beauty that you thought was underlying it, any magic you thought, it's all been explained away by science. I'm here to tell you, when you're on the forefront of science and you're making discoveries, imagination is key. Imagination is what makes you a good scientist because you are trying to come up with an, ex an explanation for something that nobody knows, right? That's the whole point. You're looking at the world, you're doing little experiments, and you're trying to figure out why these are doing the things they're doing. What mechanisms might be at play? And that is a act of imagination. The The production of hypotheses and the production, the creation of experiments to test your hypotheses, that's not something that you learn necessarily in a textbook. You have to base your, you have to learn the textbook facts, learn the basics, and then use your imagination to extend it. And in that way, uh, scientists probably require more imagination than most other professions certainly more than being a doctor. Uh, hmm. So I think that like, there's a lot of misconceptions about science, but you really do need a strong imagination. And if you listen to any of the big scientists, you know, the famous people who you see in the news, Neil deGrasse Tyson and like uh, Feynman was very big. And so was Sagan, both very big on the importance of having an active imagination, being a good scientist. Einstein would have said the same thing. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And then I have another point I'd like to, to react to. Hello? No? Yeah, okay. you're there. Joseph, um, what, what do you think um, about that? We, we've, we've given you something to chew on. What do you say to that? Okay, so uh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, what's the, your sec the second guy's name? I'm sorry. MD aware. Wait, uh, you need to be aware you, of sir? it. Yes. Just yeah. say that guy. Um, yeah. The, you, sir, uh, I would just say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not discrediting you and your profession. I believe that scientists do have, you know, an amazing imagination, like you said, uh, to just visualize the, the components and how they work in our body is, is something a lot of people can't, aren't even conscious, you know, enough to, to do. And I think that's beautiful. Um, yeah. I would like to say that uh, I still think it's, it's amazing that, you know, archaeologists, you know, their only job is to assume what the past tells. I mean... Are you saying the archaeologist's saying? job is to assume? Uh, my understanding of archaeology was to piece together with evidence the structures and... Uh, processes by which human beings lived like they're reconstructing a society based upon the remains mm -hmm. of that society there's no assumptions but there's I mean, so there's many times that they're wrong are oh they, no are they not <laughs> yeah yeah shoot, sh shoot for the moon if you miss you'll land among the stars i suppose if you don't ask the questions if you don't try you'll never get a right answer because you'll just always be wrong yes they're wrong sometimes and, do you, and to quote many hosts on this show and others, you know how they found out they were wrong? They did more archaeology and more science. That's what they did. It was never a genie and a magic lamp or some prayer crystals that proved them wrong. 
Science disproves itself, self-correcting. It's not perfect, but it's the best thing right. we've got, right? Right. Yeah. Well, what's your alternative? If, if you think that atheists are putting too much trust in science, what do you suggest? Yeah, good question. What should we do? Well, I would just say that, you know, you guys are asking some really, you guys are asking some very good questions, but atheists, I think you guys are on a, on a very good path to finding truth and whatnot in your own way. But yeah. the fact that there are just so many unknown mysteries within this world and things that science just can't explain, such as, you know, the missing links. Well, in the hasn't, hasn't yet explained, I mean, perhaps. Yeah, not yet. Okay, yeah. we can go with that. Yeah. But I don't see scientists or anybody making a time machine. You know, there's no way we, we can really think of the universe is, is this many billion years old when in a million years they're just that and, you know, we'll never know. I mean, the fact that the pyramids, I'm sure you probably you guys have probably heard this argument before, but the fact that they were, you know, built on all corners of the globe and we have no way they could have logically made that made those pyramids. I mean, that has to be truth. That has to be hang on, hang on a second. We, we Are you saying quite, quite yeah. clearly how pyramids were built and the fact yeah. that they're everywhere suggests that pyramids are a very good structure to stand up over millennia of uh, erosion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you know, like the that's the only thing that the presence of pyramids in lots in of places China. suggests. Yeah, I know. The, the, but that tells you that they last a long time. If you stack rocks in a pyramid shape, they're going to last for longer in that shape than if you made, you know, a house out of straw or something like that. Right. Yeah. That's what that tells us. I, I feel like you're getting the wrong messages. You're, yeah. you're taking the wrong lessons, perhaps, yeah. from these observations. Joseph, you know, you know, a lot of people say that these ancient people in Mesoamerica and Southeast Asia and Africa um, and different parts of the world couldn't have made pyramids because they just weren't sophisticated enough. They weren't smart enough. They weren't human enough. The people who make those arguments, not oh. you, are racists. And they don't understand that people in ancient Africa and Mesoamerica were just as smart as we are now. They just didn't have the discoveries that we were relying upon their discoveries. We're standing on their shoulders figuring these things out. I want to I I jump back. So like flush that one down the toilet too joseph so you, you made another point about all these all these christians doing all the discoveries and all these christians doing the art and i love this one because it's also a, a, a turd that needs to be flushed um yeah someone said algebra in the in the comments and that's exactly where my brain went yeah. do you know where algebra comes from friend um i'm thinking the greeks maybe I'm not it's in the sure. it's in the it's in the my, name. My daggers. It's, it's in the name. It's in Algebra. 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 Al Jazeera. Yeah. It's it's air it's an Arabic discovery. So we've got Muslim <laughs> geometers and mathematicians, right? Looking at the beauty of the world and functioning in the world. These are smart cats, right? And they developed algebra, a mathematical discipline that gets us, I don't know, I have never used it apparently, but but it, it, it's out there, right? Um, the Greeks did their geometry and their various ar arithmetical uh, proofs and all that stuff, right? Um, so you don't need Christianity to get algebra. In fact, uh, the Arabs didn't think so. Oh yeah, I'm not arguing for Christians or any religious you said, uh, you said Christian. people. I'm just saying that. Christian. Yeah, you're right. I did say Christians, but you know that's just an example of, of religious people putting society on a pedestal in a way and, and progressing society. That's that's just what I'm saying. The atheists of a thousand years ago are not the same atheists of today. Same goes for you know the Christians and whatnot. Uh, the the atheists atheist of, of a tomorrow, thousand years ago. The, the atheists of a thousand years ago would be burned at the stake. So there's something you're forgetting about. Anyone who dared speak up that sweet Genghis Kringus didn't exist or Muhammad was uh, a jerk or 
Buddha is just a metaphor or whatever. Uh, the Hindu gods are just you know, aspects of the human psychology and not actually whatever. But let's focus on Western Europe. Anyone who was an out atheist a thousand years ago, not only could they not get other atheists together to build hospitals or to commission great works of art or giant buildings dedicated to the void and the meaninglessness of life, I say it sarcastically, but they would be uh, ostracized at best and at worst being killed, okay? So this wasn't an option for early atheists. If you wanted to commission something, you had to have the approval of the wealthy and the wealthy got wealthy through their interconnections and through their approval of a dominating Catholic church, right? They were the ones that dictated a lot of the terms. And so you'd better damn well believe that uh, you had to be a Christian artist or a Christian scientist or a Christian uh, engineer in some, in some way. You are aware of history being that way, right, Joseph? Um, I was just angling at a different point of, 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 of view. Like, uh, yeah. A different... But clearly, I'm, I, but, your but point you are aware of my point, though, right? You're aware of my They're not... Yes, I'm aware of the point. I'm, I'm just saying that Christians did not hold their, their people hold their people back. But that, I'm sure that wasn't their their intent to do. Their intent was to have, you know, good. Should we, should we examine a uh, a specific case, perhaps, Joseph? Yes. Because because I put it to you that in fact Christianity, uh, for example, uh, limits imagination. Uh, Galileo proposed a heliocentric model of the universe. He was not the first one to do so, but he was the one who mm -hmm. popularly did it. And he was excommunicated by the church because the church put a limitation that said that the earth had to be the center of the universe. Right? Uh, they specifically limited what Galileo could say. They tried to stop him from proposing a heliocentric model of the universe. They failed to do so, but they tried their best. So in what way does this demonstrate that atheism uh, limits the imagination? Uh, Galileo adopted what you might call at that time an atheistic worldview while he was interpreting his observations, and it led him to a discovery that was counter to the Christian narrative. Well, to that I say that not every Christian speaks for every Christian. I, I believe in the Bible it says that we should debate with one another to reach a, a better uh, end point, or I don't know if I say end point, but it's a, a, just to have a better society, we should uh, debate with one, another, with one another. And they didn't do their job. And uh, to to go to the, the, the horrible priests and all of these people, I believe a lot of atheists, they're atheists because of something that they're, in their church, some, somebody did something to them, and now they are the way they are. But those so hey, I, are, I, Joseph, they, they don't I can agree with you that I know some atheists, I know. Joseph, I can agree with you that some atheists perhaps do not have the best reasons for being atheists. In my view, what I think are good reasons. But that doesn't mean that, again, in the same way that you can't judge all Christians based on the actions of one Christian, you can't judge all atheists based on the actions of one atheist. So what's your argument to say that atheism as a movement, as a thought process, as an ideology, limits the imagination necessarily of all people who engage in, in that belief? Well, I'm... Um, I... Me, I'm not an absolutist. I believe that as as society as a whole grows and expands, there will be instances where atheism does does do does do good things, and it does, and it will do bad things. And I, I just I just think that there's a reason why the CCP only allows atheists to join the military. It's easier to tell an atheist to kill a man than it is a Buddhist. I, I'm just saying that. I don't think atheists are, are bad people at all. I think what you guys are doing is a... Wait, what? What? Yeah, Only... yeah I... Expand. 
<laughs> enhance. Uh, only atheists are allowed to be in the military in what country? In the Chinese commun- Communist Party, they only have they only allow atheists to 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 be. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Look it up. Hey, right. you know <laughs> what, Joseph? Joseph, uh, I think you jumped the shark. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. I'm going to go ahead and drop you. And I don't know where you're getting your information from, but Joseph, if you're still listening, (laughs) if you're still tuning in to see how this call ended, I've had quite enough. I suggest that you go get some citations to your your quotes. I suggest that you, uh, I don't know, read some books about history and about science written by maybe popularization of science. MD aware, you're, you, you're aware, I'm sure, of some very interesting books on like by, by, by Carl Sagan or others who, who expound upon the beauty and the creative opportunities mm-hmm. in science. Do you have any that come to mind as I ask you right now, if not? Well, let's see. Sagan wrote one that was called Candle in the Dark, I think, like mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, say again, a candle in the a dark demon haunted the... world. That's another demon good haunted, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Demon haunted world, science as a candle in the dark. That's the subtitle, yeah. So, that's a great one. Yeah. I mean, if you're interested in more of an evolutionary spin at a very approachable level, Dawkins has the magic of reality, that's yeah. a good one as well. That's nice. And uh, Hawking has his oh, he did one that's like a very brief summary type version of a brief history of time you know mm. brief history of time is not that approachable to no, me at least yeah uh but um but he has like a even more lay version that's very approachable and they all break it down and they do a good job of communicating yeah. um and then you know honestly if you're looking for stuff like that uh youtube's a great resource you can find some very nice nicely edited interviews with people uh, and they talk about that sort of thing, their enthusiasm for the way that science can unravel the mysteries of the universe and, in a very beautiful fashion. Sometimes, so that's some good information you could get into your head, Joseph, and the folks at home and other potential callers who may be working up the, the, the confidence to call in and say stuff that's better than Joseph. But I Gosh, I really want to I want to read the books that Joseph's reading. I want to hear the bilge that's coming out of Joseph's uh, faith leaders. I, I, I really want to hear it because what Joseph was saying is so off the mark from anything that I've experienced in life. Um, I, I did, what, what is this universe that he lived? Where, where is Earth two, and how can I get there so I can so I can see that? But, you know, while you're on Earth one here. Uh, among friends, you can uh, do some podcasts and Patreon action. You can uh, look at our channel that houses all of the shows of the ACA in audio podcast form. Visit tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts. And you can listen to all the latest shows from the Atheist Experience, Talk Heathen, Truth Wanted, Nonprofits, the flagship show of the Atheist Community of Austin, all on one channel. Um, and, uh, you know, let's go on to our our next call. Um, Oh, I didn't drop. I didn't drop you, Joseph. Sorry, Joseph, you did hear that. Well, good. All right. So let's see. I think I want to take a call from Eli. Eli is a guy coming out of Texas, the Lone Star State, and he'd like to share his reason for faith in Christ. Eli, before you, before you say a word, friend. Okay. Back and forth, not an opportunity to preach. But I'm curious what your reason for for belief is. So uh, you're on you're on the air here with uh, MD Aware and, and Johnny P. What what's your reason for your faith? Um, my reason is, um, well, just the historicity of the Bible, and it doesn't make sense to me that somebody would just make make that up in context of like everything that Jesus preached and the historicity of the Jews and um, the. Are, yeah. Are, are those the only two options, Eli? Either the Bible is true or someone made it up. Uh, it's like in context of uh, like Peter testifying in second Peter 
uh, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So yeah, no, but, but my, my question is, so, so you're, so you're saying, well, uh, it's I, either the Bible is true, historically true, or someone made it up. And I'm asking if those are the only two options that are possible in your view. Yeah. Say the Bible is well, not true. That... Does that definitely mean that someone made it up? To deny that Jesus is like the Christ is to make God a liar. Okay, you're, you're sort of not answering my question. Yeah. Because there's another option, at least one more option that I can think of. Do you see where I'm going, Eli? Um, well, what would, what would be your suggestion? Well, I would suggest that perhaps they are wrong, right? They could be genuinely, you know, the people who wrote the Bible could be genuinely attempting to report things that they believe they witnessed uh, truthfully uh, in a way as factually accurate as possible. Uh, but they could simply be reporting incorrectly. And we know, for instance, that uh, all of the uh, contemporary accounts of Jesus, uh, even if you believe that Jesus was a true historical figure, any accounts would have been, uh, any eyewitness accounts would have been uh, verbally passed on for many years before they were even written down. So it's not like anyone saw the crucifixion and went home that night and wrote their journal entry, right? So there is a lot of wiggle room where inaccuracies, inner inaccuracies would have been able to sneak in. Uh, there's the broken telephone phenomenon where someone tells a story to someone else. And, you know, to mix my metaphors, the fish uh, gets bigger and bigger and bigger uh, every time you tell the story. Um, so there's a lot of ways where, you know, the Bible can be neither historically accurate nor completely fabricated whole cloth. Uh, people could have been reporting uh, what they believe to have seen. Or, you know, I sort of take personally a position based on not a whole lot of in-depth reading um, <clears throat> that perhaps these are uh, mythical tales that were meant to impart some sort of underlying message uh, and they were told in a way that is um, consistent with the way that humans remember things, which I think means that, you know, you get a whole, you have a whole bunch of tales that you want to tell. Each of them says a different, uh, gives an underlying story about ethics or morality or how you want people to behave. And you attribute all of those things to one person or one group of people. And uh, an analogy that I like to use for this is like the King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table legend, right? It's like there may or may not have been, uh, you know, an Arthur Pendragon, um, but the character of Ar King Arthur and Sir Lancelot and Guinevere and all of these, you know, Knights of the Round Table, this would have these these characters would have been known to people living in, you know, what is current day uh, England and stories were attributed to them that nobody at the time actually thought that they literally did those things. They just attributed those things to those characters because people are familiar with the characters and they know the sort of things that they would do. So my view of the Bible is not that it's completely made up, it's that perhaps these are tales that are meant to communicate a message, uh, try to educate people on morality, ethics, whatever. Uh, and they just used a uh, useful character of Jesus, for example, uh, to tell the stories. What do you think of that, Eli? Um, I think it's a way that like in science and uh, like, like we're investigating truth, like what would be the reason for these things? It's a good hypothesis. Um, but it's like when you start going to like the history of the Jews and like how they went to Babylon and then Daniel's captivity in Babylon and there was like an angel that appeared to him and he mentioned 
that there was like this prophecy that was given about like the Messiah and putting an end to sin and how he would be cut off from his people. And um, like there was all these things. Um, yeah, book says a lot of stuff. The other situation. Book says a lot of stuff, Eli. Um, um, <clears throat> are you familiar with the Are you familiar with the Book of Mormon? Yes, but it's like Jesus did warn against false prophets, and Joseph Smith. That's not my point. His so you are aware of the that, Book of Mormon, okay? So we've got an individual that we know historically existed, Joseph Smith, right? He's not a legend; he's a person. Well, and then he made certain claims. We know he exists because we have his arrest record. Okay? We know he existed. And he made certain claims. We know that, I think he was born in, I believe he was born in Vermont. We know Vermont exists. We know he moved to New York at some point. We know New York exists. Then he headed west. I think he went to Missouri. Um, we know Missouri exists. We know that people followed him. And we know that he has writings. We know that people read the writings and attested to those writings. We have good reason to believe those people existed as well. We know the church continues to exist in large part. A uh, big, big presence over there in Utah. Beautiful state, by the way. Right. And we have temples and we have texts and we have the genealogical work that they do. We know they exist. But the claims that are made by the Mormons or the Church of Latter-day Saints, whatever they're calling themselves this week, um, are fantastical claims golden tablets and seeing stones and uh, angel Moroni and other, other unlikely characters from history and fiction. Okay. We know that the Jews shifting gears, we know that the Jews existed for a long, long time and they're still here and they're not going anywhere. All right. We know they have traditions. In fact, I believe yesterday was Rosh Hashanah or thereabouts. So, you know, Shabbat Shalom friends out there. But we know these people exist, and they have traditions, and they were in Babylonian exile, allegedly. And they were in, I made a joke about that yesterday, it was well received. And um, Less so today. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I have a recipe for an ancient 4,000-year-old um, Mesopotamian stew, and I was going to suggest making it, and then I said, too soon? And, and there, was, there were many laughs had. Anyhow, um, we know that these, these people like, that exist and we know that Judea exists and we know that Egypt exists, but we don't know for a fact or even beyond a reasonable doubt that other things like angels appearing and red seas parting and manna exist. We just know that they are stories. And so just because uh, the Jews have existed for a long period of time, doesn't mean that their fantastical supernatural claims are true. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the Mormons. Right. Or it's like the Spider-Man thing. Right. Yeah, Where, uh, okay. you know, uh, Spider-Man, the comic book takes place in New York City. New York City is a real place. It refers to real events that actually yeah. happened in reality. But that doesn't yeah. mean that Spider-Man as a character exists or the events yeah. detailed in Spider-Man comics are true. Peter or Ben Parker. Pick your poison. So mm. so Eli, what? What are your thoughts on that? So we've given you examples of books that talk about real places and real people and then other stuff on top of that. You will acknowledge that that just because it's written down doesn't mean that it happened, right? Yeah, but there is other evidence that does suggest situations you, that you, reflect you use the, this as the an things example. that occurred. So okay, what, okay. what evidence matters most to you, Eli? Where is it found? Is it found yeah. in the Bible? It's, uh, you can find it anywhere, like Sennacherib, uh, the king of Assyria in 70, 700 AD, he makes mention of Hezekiah. And when Sennacherib, when the Assyrians were going to attack Jerusalem, it's mentioned in, in that uh, Hezekiah prayed to God. And the okay. Lord said okay. that he was going to put his hook in, in Sennacherib's mouth and take him back to where he came. And it's written in the Assyrian continuer form. That Sennacherib mentions that he left Hezekiah as a bird in a cage in Jerusalem. And Hezekiah was one of the people that said that defied, like it was said that he defied uh, Sennacherib. But Sennacherib and had like killed every other king that had uh, denied uh, Sennacherib. But it was only Hezekiah that he didn't. And 
the Syrian conquest from uh, Sennacherib ended at Jerusalem. So you're telling me that you're telling me that the that there was a, a conflict between two cultures, and and the un, and, and one kingdom, one one um, hegemonic entity was dominating the area, and the underdogs, everyone was fallen one after the other after the other, and it seemed impossible. We're talking like Ivan Drago levels of beatdown, right? And then seemingly out of nowhere the underdog pulls it out they pulls it off and pulls it off and and defeats the overwhelming power of the dominating force and then it's not possible in your mind that they're like holy crap it must have been god that made this happen it couldn't have been fortune uh, you know like 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 luck luck or or like really good strategic action on the part of the military leaders or weather events or incompetence on the part of the military leaders or anything else that can happen in battle we've got an example of it right now happening in ukraine where like a huge military is unable to get over the top they can't quite close the deal on uh the people of ukraine Right. So there's there's factors in there, right, that can result to seemingly overwhelming odds, not actually delivering an easy victory. Right. Yeah. And um, but I believe that the Lord has control over everything. He's the one that raises. You believe teams. the Lord has control um, over everything. But we don't we know you believe that yeah, we're asking for the why. OK. I believe I believe in all kinds of things, but it, who cares? It's the why that matters. And you call to tell us the why. So give us the why. And if it's because the Bible talks about wars that happen, who cares? We just talked about that for about 10 minutes. Um, give us the why. It has to be a God as opposed to just the vicissitudes of, of combat. There's like, uh, well, one of the other things is like prophecy, like in the Psalms, it mentions that like they pierced my hands and feet and crucifixion wasn't invented until the Romans. Okay, but again, like <clears throat> historical uh, arguments aside about that, you're still a book predicting something that's going to happen later in the same book is problematic. So uh, like that doesn't do anything for me. And I don't believe that that's necessarily true either. That there was no such thing. That nobody got nailed to anything before the Romans rolled around. Yeah. There's lots of things going on here. I, I typed in, they have pierced my hands and feet real quickly on Wikipedia. So, you know, like a one second search says there's, there's a lot here. It may be read literally as like a lion, my hands and my feet, right? The syntactical form of this Hebrew phrase appears to be lacking a verb. In this context, the phrase was commonly explained in early rabbinical paraphrases as they bite like a lion, my hands and my feet. Well, are you going to oh. say then, therefore, that that predicted that the Romans were going to throw Christians to the lions? Because that sounds just as likely as they pierced my hands and feet talking about the uh, crucifixion. Again, two seconds. I typed it in. Uh, well, That's how long it took to do that research, man. Yeah, uh, um, I don't necessarily trust Wikipedia. I, I mean, I've done my research on Wikipedia too. So it's like it's nice to get information from other people and sources, yeah. but we also have to investigate certain situations. Uh, Are like you familiar with a the concept Eli called confirmation bias? Yes, but there's also um, witnesses. And when it comes to the things that Jesus preached, it's like I cannot fathom a person making that up, like saying that there would be persecution and people would be killed and certain things like that. And it's like, why would you preach or make something up like this? Like, why why do that? Unless it's because for, you like, believe it, perhaps? Where it's because like, they believe it. Yeah. It, sorry, MD, take it. Uh, people do all sorts of things because they believe it or because they don't believe it and they're being paid to do it. 
you know, there's like a million. How do you figure out what someone's motivation is? I don't know. You ask them and maybe you believe them. But the point is like, just because someone does something and they say they're doing it because they believe in God doesn't mean that God is real. People flew planes into the Twin Towers. We had a anniversary of that event recently yeah. and they believed in that too. And they were persecuted. They died for that belief. Yeah. Does that mean that their beliefs they were, are true? They were the persecutors. D they, they died the persecutors themselves as well. The yeah. They you, died. Are... They died themselves as well. The point, Eli, is: does that does the fact that they suffered for their beliefs mean that their beliefs are true? They were led by a false prophet. Ah. Like something that the truth had testified of. Right. So. What about Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer? Those were the three witnesses whose joint testimony in conjunction with a separate statement by eight witnesses, uh, they sort of verified Joseph Smith and his magical seeing stones and his golden tablets. So those three people, I'm going to, are they liars or are they mistaken? Are they, are they liars or are they rubes? Which one is it? Because you don't believe in 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 Mormonism, sure. right? Yeah, it's like if you analyze it in terms of like prophetic events and in relation to well, it's testifying that it's a part of the Bible. It's like these individuals they made their own books at that time, and they mentioned that the prophecy in the in their books is like those twelve apostles. The uh, like they mentioned that the people that they're going to do like. They mentioned that they're going to leave out precious portions of the Bible and anybody that follows them is going to go to hell, like things like that. Okay. And that's my question. you have to Are question, they... like, where did they get their? Okay. Okay. Where did they get their information from? Is that what you were going to say? I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, my question is, are they correct? Are they mistaken? Or are they liars? Which is it? They had, they had to be mistaken because. Okay. You mentioned like give them prophecy of something that hadn't occurred yet because according to the mormon church like those tablets were written like before the apostles and jesus and then but and it's like like that apparently testifies of the witness that the apostles were going to witness of christ but they were going to lie about it or t or leave out precious portions and it's like um it's clearly fabricated it's not something okay. that God would do, especially when it's not even mentioned in the Old Testament where the Jews have their canon. We have like the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that, where it has no mention of the texts that Joseph Smith had or any. Why mention. would they fabricate? God would clearly it. have. Why mentioned. would the three witnesses fabricate that stuff? Why? Because they wanted to be deceivers, and they wanted oh. to like their. Th and it's like yeah. the thing about the early church is that the early church, it's like they were the ones that were putting their life on the line and testifying for the truth. Joseph Smith wasn't doing that, and neither was Muhammad. It's like these people he were was, persecutors and liars trying he to was deceive chased, people. He was on chased across the, the country. He was constantly getting chased across the country and prosecuted by the authorities for being a charlatan. He could have stopped doing that and taken up an honest living of turnip farming or something, right? He chose to defraud so he could live and get laid from people in the church, right? People in his little cult. So if that happened in the 19th century, are people so very different that you can't even imagine that people in, in first century uh, Roman Empire might also okay, fudge the details on the one hand or be taken in by a fantastic story that gives them hope. Right? I I don't... Yeah, it's, but it's also like Christ in terms of like the witness and he did fulfill the messianic promises. It's something that like there is a chronological date who? given from the time Says of Daniel. Who? Says who he he he, he Daniel. Him. Yeah. So so you're telling me that early Christians who were mostly all Jews, who had access to these ancient holy books, 
with all of these prophecies in it, there's no way in hell that they could have been like, oh, check it out. Um, he checks off this box. He checks off this box. He checks off this box. There's no confirmation bias possible there. Right. It's the only explanation is that he truly and really did fulfill vague ass prophecies. That's that's your position. It's not a possibility that they're like they're fulfilling the prophecy that was written by rewriting the story of Jesus, like with good intentions, bad intentions or whatever. That's not even possible in your imagination. It's a, I want to hear you, I want to hear you say it's possible. Like, really, I just want to hear you say it's possible. It's OK. Well, it's nice to you're, you're arguing to that people that these people fabricated it. And that's what I was mentioning, that it's like it either has to be a lie no. or told in the no. truth. No. And no. in behalf of they could have like, believed it. Yeah, they could have yeah. believed that yeah. that he did. Right. They could be reading. They could be suffering from the same confirmation bias that you yeah. yourself are suffering from, Eli, and saying that, oh, wow, didn't it say in the book that uh, the Messiah was going to do this? He did a thing that was kind of like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that that you means that he, he fits it, right? Like, it, for me, if I was designing a, an ex if if I were de de devising an experiment to test whether or not something fulfilled a prophecy, one of the conditions yeah. would be that the prophecy is sealed. And so specific, I think, is one of the things in time and place and sealed uh, blinded is another one right so if you wanted to prove to me if you wanted to tell me that prophecies prove that jesus is uh you know historically important and historically is uh, or the historicity and the prophecies prove his divinity then you have to convince me that none of the people who wrote about jesus fulfilling the prophecies knew what the prophecies were and that the prophecies were like it's going to be at this specific time under these specific circumstances this person's going to be born and they're going to have xyz happen to them and then that happens and we know that they couldn't communicate with each other because otherwise your experiment is contaminated you cannot be sure that someone didn't intentionally or un unintentionally fudge the stories yeah and it's like, well, that's the thing. Like the Jews, like have held their scripture for a long time, and they like, they just, uh, they teach that to their children, and then that's why uh, the apostles knew that they were witnessing the Christ because they had been taught these things from their youth, and they yeah, you know that the Eli, Jews themselves don't believe Christ. that Jesus is yeah. the Messiah, right? Yeah, only a small segment of those Jews believed it. And Eli, you're just kind of, you're kind of just skipping over all these great points that MD just made. And you're back to your position. I don't feel that there's real engagement here. I really feel that you're just hunkering down in your position. And I'm going to tell you something. I honestly, if you had said something that caused me to give pause, I will, I will honestly engage with you. I feel that you're so um, hunkered down in your position that this is actually like a true story that you're not really willing to critically evaluate the claims. They, the book says a whole yeah. bunch of crap, okay? There are no named witnesses that anybody can cross-reference from history. The book is self-contained. A couple of weeks ago, we did like the power strip plugged into itself. You can't use the book to prove itself. It's just ridiculous when you try to do so. It doesn't work, right? You talk about, well, they died for themselves. There's a bunch of great YouTubers who have talked about that. The evidence that we have that any of the apostles died, right, preaching their their version of of uh of, of a modified judaism is pretty damn scant man the church tradition says they died but if you look at the actual history of it we don't have anything really outside of of the church out of out of um out of the bible so it's again like there's so many steps in this process to prove that the book exists and you're kind of you're kind of skipping over a lot of it and then saying, well, I believe the book is true because of the book. But you, if you were to break it down a little well, bit and go provided. step by step, say ahead, go ahead. Sorry. 
Yeah, like I provided evidence outside of that. I just finished talking with another call show. And the other thing, yeah. there's brimstone found in in Sodom and Gomorrah. Like it's like in Sodom and Gomorrah is in the plains of the Jordan. And the Jordan yeah. River drains into the Dead Sea. And the areas where the Dead Sea waters have receded, there's brimstone found that's uh, you, like of you certain called another, that is not found anywhere else on the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talked you talk to another call show. And I'm going to I'm going to make a a prediction because I haven't watched it. You got trashed. The fact that there is a fire and or brimstone in a location does not prove that a magical story explaining it is true. Again, New York exists. The Empire State Building they exists. They deny the evidence. It doesn't mean that the Daily Bugle exists. It doesn't mean that Eddie Brock became Venom. Okay? Just because there's a thing like a physical thing, a king, a burnt forest, a pyramid, or whatever, doesn't mean that the metaphys metaphysical, the, the, the supernatural explanations for that thing is the explanation for what actually happened. You're using the book to prove itself, and I don't care how many times oh, they find... Brimstone is there. What is brimstone? What do you think brimstone is, Eli? Yeah, what do you think it? it is? Do you know what it is? It's sulfur. Yeah, yeah it's, sulfur. it's sulfur. Correct. It's an element. Sulfur is found around. In fact, like, it's very commonly found. It's found everywhere. It's not like, oh, this is an exotic material that true. only comes from the fictional, uh, you know, place of hell. You know, it's not like <sighs> Mithril or something like that. Damn. Where, uh, <laughs> where the, the mere existence of it in a place confirms the existence of something else right like yeah. you find sulfur anywhere you go it's not uncommon that's like i think what you might call circumstantial evidence it's not of that purity what do you mean because what purity did it say somewhere of, in the bible the purity of the brimstone like oh this is 98.5 percent no, it... brimstone like what are you talking about they've tested it and it comes above 90 percent purity which is Brimstone or what? sulfur is really found only at forty percent purity and commonly around the world. This has and so you think, and so your and explanation. It, it, let me it, just get it, this straight, it, Eli. It, Give me a second. Let me just get this straight. So you think that because they found uh, sulfur at a purity level that is uncommon, that therefore the only explanation for that fact is that there was a divine intervention, God smote uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Is that correct? That's the only possible explanation for that fact. It is aligned with Abraham going west of the Jordan, which is where Jerusalem is currently located, and his descendants went back to Abraham's land. And we see that, that it's west of the Jordan, and the brimstone is found where the Dead Sea waters have receded. I'm going to quote Sagan. Uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If your claim is that a, there was divine intervention, then you're going to need to come with something better than there's 90% pure sulfur. I don't even know if that claim is accurate. I don't know yeah. any of the veracity of those claims, but I do know that those claims, even if true, are insufficient to justify the conclusion in my scientific expertise. Yep. And that's, uh, that's enough that's enough of that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to put on and uh, take another call. Okay. Thanks, Eli. Yeah. Thanks, Genuinely. Thanks, Eli. I know I sound sarcastic, but we do like getting these calls. Yeah. And you got me feeling a bit spicy, but I think we've exhausted. From... No. Yeah, we've exhausted that, uh, that well of information. Argument from matches bridgestone <laughs> yeah i don't know all right we got a loke guy calling from california golden state says slow growth of atheism and how that impacts morality um what do you mean by that a loke tell us more yeah this is a look uh, no that was not my question my question was that i think the slow growth of atheism in u.s compared to Western Europe and other developed countries uh, is primarily because of three reasons, because we are the mainly Christian country and so so were they. 
And obviously, if you read the stats and if you go there, you can see how how soon they have changed, especially in Scandinavia. So I think the three main reasons, apart from how gullible we are, is uh, morality uh, and spirituality. Uh, morality in the sense that even people on the fence do not quite understand how where and how we get our morality from. Uh, we can send them the secular humanist manifesto all we want, but at the end of the day, they will think that some human beings have made it up. And the spirituality debate is a bit interesting um, because I come from a very technical background and a lot of my uh, circle is, is technical. And they are okay with everything with atheism except that they are looking for some kind of higher purpose. And I, I, by higher purpose, I don't mean uh, better family, better connections, but something something more in this life, which I think uh, they think atheism doesn't offer. So I think these two things are uh, helping them not join us so I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. MD, what you got? I'm not sure I really followed your line of thinking the whole way through. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is that we, well, I, I say we, I'm Canadian, uh, but the the U.S., uh, is predominantly Christian, and so the in it's in the fabric of the society that you need some sort of like higher power to direct you in terms of your goals and the sort of like higher level um, satisfaction with your life. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking about, Alok? That was my second point, that even people who might be very scientific, at least in my circle, who want to join... Uh, or want to consider atheism, they they think th that uh, we are we are uh, devoid of this aspect that we dismiss spirituality as uh, nothing, and we think it is voodoo, and they think uh, there's I... there's some meaning to it, and we don't we don't answer that question. And the first one was they they don't understand where we get our morality from. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, so I got that. I mean, I heard you mention that, you know, uh, they'll say that people just made it up and like, yeah, like that's like people made up all of these things, right? Yeah, that's what like it looks people like. Made up, yeah. People made up the the rules of secular morality and they also made up the rules of biblical morality, right? Uh, they're just attributing it to a different source. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Uh, that is... I think that's a hang up that perhaps uh, exists in the fabric of some Western societies. I think that some people have been breaking free of it, but I also think that it's hard to paint atheism with a, with so broad a brush. And I think there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of movements, religions, spiritual followings, whatever you'll call it, that uh, fulfill that need that people might have. That are positive. They are they may not be atheists. They may not brand themselves as atheists, but they might be, for all intents and purposes, uh, atheist, secular humanist, and uh, but they also add in some sort of you know higher calling or something like that. Um, and I think that we have to resign ourselves to the fact that some people will have a really difficult time breaking free of that perceived need for some sort of divine uh, hand divinely handed down declaration of what we should care about and what matters in the world. Uh, some people will uh, need it and some people won't. And I don't know if we can do anything about that, but I think that the fact that there are uh, there's like sort of a long menu of different options that people can choose from and uh, all atheists do it a little bit differently. I think Um so, I mean, it's just a, you're pointing out, a, I think, a valid fact about reality, but I don't know that there's anything that we can necessarily do about it. So, well, what I'm trying to ask is, if I'm an atheist and and someone is on the fence and they ask me, uh, as an atheist, how do I practice spirituality? I think most of the, sh uh, 
anchors on the on the shows have been dismissive their spirituality is a vague and voodoo word and yeah i would i would ask them what they mean by spirituality yeah because i don't really know what spirituality means alok uh i agree nobody knows what it means they have notions but everyone seems to disagree and the definitions always fall apart i wouldn't be dismissive about it because i know what they kind of mean Right. I think we all kind of know what they mean, a sense of one's place in the universe, the greater connectedness we have with others in the universe and uh, meaning in life and things like that. And so how does an atheist practice spirituality? Well, first of all, they try to get away from that term and call it what it is, uh, the greater search for meaning. Individualized though it may be, it is the individual's journey to craft meaning in their lives even if it's meaninglessness it's it's uh, there's the, the question of meaning and the question of connectedness and so i suppose one can do that many ways by volunteering by uh personal improvement art poetry film uh, uh literature um caretaking of others right like having children taking care of them uh, giving them the best life they can taking care of our elders and things like that and because we are humanists largely although plenty of us in the comments may be atheists but we're certainly not humanists are we um uh our focus is on living beings human life and maybe animal life and plant life whatever that might be and so the spiritual journey is probably going to go the, the meaning the search for meaning is probably going to go in that direction and that'll 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 occupy it for a good five thousand years there's so much to do in this world uh Spoiler alert, you're not going to get through all of it. You're going to die. And so making this journey as meaningful to yourself as possible. I think there's a really good Jean-Luc Picard quote in there somewhere, but I don't have it at, at, uh, at the ready. But is that, does that answer your question, Alo? Because we're going to move on. Yeah, thank you, guys. I appreciate your call. Thank you so much, Alo. Hope to hear from you again. Thanks. Um, all right. I'm going to go into our Super Chats which we have not done yet. Um, MD, would you do the honor uh, of getting our super chats? You're going to have to scroll up a little bit in our chat. Okay. Uh, so let's see. We had, I mean, some of these are, are uh, I think, referring to some specific calls that were made earlier. Uh, Joe Lonsdale, he uh, donated five pounds, uh, British pounds. Um he was pointing out that one of our calls was yet another theist with a horribly naive idea of what science is, how it works, and how much we do know. I think that's probably in reference to the, uh, I think it was Joseph who thought that scientists have no imagination. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with you, uh, Joe. Um, Jimmy Jr., uh, he uh, generously gave uh, $4.99. Uh, didn't quite round it up. Uh, he was pointing out that a Roman military outpost in 2nd century, century Syria, Dia Europa, had Hebrew, Christian, and Mithraist churches. By Eli's logic, Mithraism is true. That's Good also true. Yeah. Good enough for me. Yeah. And uh, Helen Lawson donated 10 British pounds. Humanism really needs to be pushed more than atheism. Humanism is a route to atheism, but soft enough to reduce kickback and entrenchment. And frankly, I agree. Like, I remember when I was deconstructing, I was literally afraid. Like, I felt true fear at the thought when I first had it that I might be an atheist. Uh, you know, I think it's much more approachable because humanism is an easier pill to swallow. Everyone wants to care about people and humans because, you know, we're humans. We love caring about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I agree. I mean, uh, this is the atheist experience uh, and the atheist community of Austin. Uh, so we have a bit of a bias uh, systemically uh, <laughs> towards that. But I mean, I, I agree with your general approach, uh, Helen. Uh, humanism is a much more palatable way to get into the hearts and minds of uh, people we might be wanting to win over. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree with that. All right. Well, you know, um, we have... Um, a few more things I'd like to talk about before we take our last call. Uh, merch. Uh, you can visit our store for our limited edition T-shirt of the month. God's kryptonite. Judges 1, verse 19. He couldn't defeat iron chariots. Visit tiny.cc slash 
merch ACA to get that shirt and other shirts like that now. Isn't that, isn't that funny that the imagination and technology of ancient Judeans was the absolute limit of God's power, it seems. Mm. Well, I'm sure there's some explanation for that. Uh, let's let's see the crew. Show us the crew. There's some folks down there. We've got some lovely people and animals who are a kind of people. Cat cam, uh, bunny cam. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you don't see bunnies very often. It's true. Crew, crew hair. Um, all right. So I want to take our last call from Michael. Michael is a guy from Florida, and he wants to ask about morality. Well, that's pretty generic. What do you want to ask about morality, Michael? You're on the you're on AXP with uh, MD Aware and Johnny P Angel. Well, not hello. hearing anything. Oh, hello. there you are. Sorry, hello. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, um, not not just about morality in general, but more so about uh the argument for morality for the existence of God that I've heard many theists usually posit. Like I know this one of the favorite arguments that, say, William Lane Craig likes to use. Um, but the, the, the way that uh, I've normally heard, I'm not sure if I'm misrepresenting the argument, but I believe the syllogism is something like, um, if God doesn't exist, then objective morality and then moral duties don't exist. Moral, moral objectives, uh, um, objective morality seemingly does exist, therefore God exists. But I always found that, that first premise was a little bit weird, if not arbitrary, because... Mm -hmm. Even if one were to concede the idea of objective morality, I mean, like, I don't know why that necessarily has to be tethered to the idea of a God. Like, I think C.S. Lewis said that, oh, a conscience proves God because that points to a lawgiver, um, seeing as those are moral law on our heart. But I, I always figured, and I'm not sure, and what I'm asking is what you guys might think of this interpretation, um, which is that I, I always thought that morality could just also be thought um, to be sort of like a a social, if not psychological, form of the idea of like health. Like we sure. have an idea of what health is objectively. We know what it is when a person's sick or not well. And I always thought that therefore, if you apply that in a social or psychological context, you could say that something that somebody is doing is bad or evil or wrong. Sure. Um, and of course, that that would invoke like a, a myriad, a plethora of, of nuances when you you're like discussing different circumstances or different um, cultures, I guess. But nonetheless, I'm like, w w would it be? Do you think it would be fair to just call that some sort of sense of objective morality to look at morality as a a sort of social slash psychological um, incarnation of health? I'm not sure. That's what I was wondering about. What you guys thought thought about that? MD, Scott, you're a doctor. I mean, I mean, totally. Uh, I. 100% think that, I mean, the terminology might be problematic. I don't know if you'd call it morality, but our certainly our sense of uh, fairness and justice and right and wrong is to a certain extent coded genetically and evolved. And we've done experiments that can demonstrate that sort of thing. The classic one is um, you have two monkeys in cages beside each other and you give one of them like one piece of food and you give the other one two pieces of food and the one who got one piece of food gets really upset because they recognize that what just happened is unfair. Um, and there's a lot of background, like, you know, more, even more basic experiments uh, demonstrating the, that these uh, impressions are not isolated to humans. Um, and they can go down to so-called lower level animals and uh, creatures. But certainly the, you know, at some level, it all breaks down to what is biologically good and bad for an organism or for a gene. If you subscribe to the uh, gene theory of evolution, um, the selfish gene theory, rather. Um, <clears throat> so 100 percent like that's certainly my view is that uh, all um judgments the object the objective thing is not the should right the objective thing is you know when i hit someone they sustain tissue injury uh to their body that's a physical brute fact of biology and physics and 
the f- and they feel pain. That's the interpretation. Their body interprets that damage as pain. And they're programmed genetically to think pain is negative. It is associated with a negative feeling. And so obviously society has evolved based on uh, those individual level experiences and realities to develop a uh, societal law or societal um, expectation that we should generally avoid things that give people negative experiences and try to uh, pursue things that give them positive experiences. And I completely believe that it boils down at its base level down to biology. Um, so I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, I don't think that there's any real debate, uh, among scientists about that. Uh, I think that philosophers, moral philosophers have different opinions perhaps. Uh, but maybe they're also not, uh, asking the question in exactly the same way. Um, what do you think about that, Michael? Uh, yeah, no, uh, um, I, I, well, like you said, you, you agree with me, uh, and I, I think that what you're saying is just expounding on what I was um, hinting at, because, um, like, the, the way I've usually seen um, uh, theists in, in debates uh, usually uh, uh, talk about this is that, oh, without God, then there is no sense of right or wrong, it's just, it's just a sense of preference. But I'm like, I, I always, even even because I'm more or less in a phase of deconstructing my faith, um, mm. uh, even when I was more devout, I always thought of the idea of good or bad as that which tends towards life or that which tends towards death, respectively. And in that sense, I always um, figured morality to be like a, you know, just the, the sense of what is uh, promoting health or, or destroying health. In you know, in a variety of ways, not just physically, but also psychologically, emotionally, um, and um, so like when they say that, oh, is it, you know, sexual assault or rape um, wrong? I and mean, you say someone would say yes, and then it's like, oh, how can you know that if they're, if God doesn't tell you to do it, they tell you that's wrong. I'm like, well, because we can see the harm that it does upon the victim, mm-hmm. and it's like I don't think it takes a, a theologian to 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 be able to decipher that, you know, when somebody's in pain, because I mean, we have the ability to have empathy, that's at least one way that we can, uh, uh, you know, take the, ascertain that somebody's in pain. And I don't know, I, I, I was, I wasn't sure. I never really heard somebody retort. I mean, I just haven't watched the right videos, but I've never, I've hardly ever heard somebody retort to I mean, yes, when they bring up the argument for morality. In this I mean, I think the so thing like, that people yeah. will retort is they will say, okay, you're stating facts. Like, yes, people feel bad when I punch them, but that doesn't mean that I ought not punch them, right? It's the is ought gap uh, that I think a lot of theists will point to, uh, which is perhaps a fair uh, criticism. Uh, This is ought gap is a thing in like um, in moral philosophy. Uh, But I think that the the solutions that um, religious and theological uh, explanations uh, comport uh, or put forward, they they don't actually solve uh, any problems or they create uh, problems of their own, right? Um, just for example, like the question of from where does the moral law truly arise? Do, is it because God is powerful and it's a and it's a might makes right situation? So we do what God uh, says is good because he's very he's the strongest guy around. Or is it right independent of God's strength, in which case it doesn't actually originate from God? You know, like there's all, all of these other problems uh, that uh, smarter and more dedicated people have pointed out about these arguments. Um, but suffice to say that the I think the criticism of the view that you and I are agreeing on is that it doesn't actually tell you any oughts. It tells you it probably explains from a scientific and a reason perspective why we feel, you know, intuitively why we are evolved and why our society has evolved to tell us we ought not do those things that harm other people that detract from health or whatever reasoning or whatever uh, wordage uh, you chose. Uh, 
that's probably why it is that way, but it doesn't actually tell us that we ought not do those things properly but in a moral philosophy. Of, uh, not, uh, I was just going to ask, wouldn't a clause of like ought not or um, ought to be predicated of like, it, it isn't, I, I always thought that needs, like, you know, what you should do or what you ought to do is always based on a desire. If you want to live, you ought to breathe. You ought to feed yourself. You ought to take care of your health. And therefore, in the same way, morally speaking, if you want to live, um, uh, you know, a, a healthy life, you ought to do certain um, moral duties. I don't know. Right. If if you that, if you predic you know, if you put those premises in, then sure, we can agree yeah. on that. But uh, theists okay. will not necessarily agree on that. And moral philosophy, I think, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, assume those uh, outcomes, those ifs. If you want to blank, mm -hmm. then you ought to do this. I think, uh, again, without being a philosopher, that moral philosophy is concerned about what ought we do, stop. And it, then we can go, well, if our goal is X, then we ought to do Y. It's a lot easier. So I think that the, uh, the arbitrary decision is deciding that we care about well-being, for instance, or we care about minimizing suffering. Uh, that is subjective. Once you take that subjective uh, axiom or that subjective goal, then the steps to get there are objective. And that's going back to like Lane Craig's thing. Like, oh, it seems like we have objective uh, moral rules. Only if we already agree on what the uh, desired outcome is, then we can make objective assessments against that uh, that goal. But I think that people would take issue with where and how you're establishing what the goal is. Because I imagine a theist would not agree that with that. They would say that there is an ultimate ought. And the ultimate ought is whatever God says ought to happen. Sure. Um, so that's what I would imagine some theists might say about that. And, and, I, and I, I think, to, to go back to where we started, I, th I think there is a biological and social reality that it harkens back to. It, not to belabor the point, but... Those societies that didn't recognize or honor those those uh, biological realities of you know, resource management, individual rights, freedoms, uh, you know, a preference for pleasure over pain, security over wild risk, uh, don't exist anymore. Either because they were killed off, uh, outperformed, or individuals left to the extent that they could for societies that would provide those basic biological and social needs. And um, we haven't really changed our biological organism in the uh, you know, 6,000 years that humans have existed on this earth. And so the, where we see differences in societies, it's different takes on the same approach. And I, I tend to notice that in those places where certain groups don't have certain rights or protections, those are places where those individuals have less political power. How convenient that that might be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. And as far as, as far as how many angels can dance on the head of a pin of whether or not a, a, a moral virtue is, uh, objective, subjective, contingent, or whatever that, that is, that's cool. Um, and that's an interesting question. Um, and hopefully we're not putting the practical pragmatic approach of looking at it to try to maximize, uh, human well-being according to certain metrics that people report they value over uh you know the the intellectual exercise of figuring out uh, some sort of proof some sort of um uh, philosophical proof for why somebody somebody should prefer x over y so that's our that's mm -hmm. my take and we're all on the same page i appreciate your call uh okay. thank you yeah. so much on this you take care yeah all right well, that, uh, that leads the question to me. Uh, have you said to yourself, I love the, uh, the, uh, the atheist community of Austin's content. Uh, I, wish I, could, I wish I could just mainline it all day, every day for hundreds of hours. Well, you can do that very thing, friends. All you need to do is go to our 24-hour live streams, AXP TV, 
which delivers a constant stream of shows, clips, and specials from 26 seasons of Atheist Experience and Heathen TV, which provides you with clips from Talk Heathen from its very inception to the very present. Watch or simply listen to your favorite host. Discover some new ones you never heard of. Visit tiny.cc slash AXPTV and tiny.cc slash Heathen TV to join the fun. We've got a or share your experience, I want to tell you, remember this, put it in the comments, please, because I've seen some in the live chat, and you better be putting those in the comments, people. What do you think Jesus' last words really were? Something about cigarettes, says MD Aware. Uh, we'll read it off next week. Um, remember, you can uh, make a lasting impression on the ACA participating by participating in our brick fundraiser. Go to tiny.cc slash ACA Bricks for more information. MD Aware, this is our first time working together. But I I make a prophecy that it won't be our last and God will determine and me trying to make it happen that that will happen perhaps on, on Truth Wanted, perhaps? Oh, I think uh, I will also work towards that goal. We'll make that prophecy a reality. Hmm. It, so it is written, so it shall be done. Uh, thank you for being here with me today. And everyone, have a great week. Make, uh, make some positive change in the world. Take care. Bye-bye. Watch Talk Heathen Live Sundays at 1 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTTH and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call TH.